So ladies and gentlemen, Dean Kamen, the, obviously the inventor of the Segway and uh, one of the deep thinkers we have. Well, let's see. Especially after uh, Harris, I am not sure uh, what we're here to do or exactly what level to, uh, to deal with the issues. To step back to what I think everybody here is talking about, transportation, but it, it's so broadly defined, I'd like to recap the history of what I see as the issues of transportation, particularly related to dense areas and cities, because I think that's what we were addressing with this. And since I only have a few minutes, we're going to have to race through all the inventions that really caused the problems. And the car is not necessarily the first big one. So here's a very compressed piece of human history. Uh, the Earth was formed. It did OK. It got really cold. The dinosaurs all died. Um, people started walking, which was unique and unusual. We stand up. Um, the first really big invention that started this problem, I think, is the plow. People argue, but it's somewhere between 8,500 and 10,000 years ago. The plow allowed people to start going from hunter-gatherers to organized societies. From the day they did that, it is indisputable that the most powerful anthropogenic uh, uh, force among humanity is that we live in communities. Once we started living in communities, we developed language, which gave us history, which gave us the capability to learn from our own mistakes, or at least to improve on doing them more effectively in each new generation. Uh, in any event, we started building towns and cities. As soon as we started doing that, we started having congestion problems. It's always been interesting to me that ancient Greece, well over 3,000 years ago, uh, in fact, Mesopotamia, it is well known that the ancient cities had rules, laws, like you can't bring your cart and ox inside the city walls from one hour before sunrise till one hour after sunset. You don't have to be a genius to figure out. They were already concerned about traffic jams when you put big animals and machines among people that had architected a pedestrian environment. There were only one and a half million people on the planet at the time, and they had problems because they were mixing modes in highly dense pedestrian urban environments. It didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. Let's skip, because we're running out of time, the next 9,900 years or so. And uh, you get to 101 years ago, 1903. Here's just some data for you. Can't argue with it, because it's data. We can argue about what it means. Interestingly, in that same year, in terms of transportation, Henry Ford built his first car, and the Wright brothers flew the first airplane. Here's the situation. This is just a situation analysis. In that year, 9% of the global population lived in cities. 91% of the world didn't live in cities. Most of them were farmers, even in the United States. The world was good for the people that lived in the cities. A, the cities were small. They weren't congested by cars. People generally walked around. That's what sort of defined a city. That's for 2,000 years what defined a city, a place where people could go from place to place where they work and where they think and where there's art and where there's food on their feet. And those 9% of the people did that. The rest of the people, of course, had problems because they had to go through great distances and carry all of their hay or their strawberries or their nails. And so horses and carts that had been used for thousands of years were still being used, carrying heavy stuff, going great distances. Henry Ford figures he can solve that problem. It's pretty clear from everything he wrote he never anticipated that cars would be filling up cities. 
The Wright brothers also never assumed that people would fly from one block to the next. He got it right, so did we. We built airports for his invention. We started out 40 years later building highways for the other invention, but then things went awry. Anyway, skip ahead a little bit, and here's some interesting new data for you. By the way, Henry Ford, when he started building these things, he did build the product that changed the world in a very positive way. And oh, by the way, not to be the pure contrarian here, and of course I'm taking a, a, a extreme perspective here, and I'm aware that I'm doing that. It sometimes helps people think. But I'll take the perspective that the reason that we're having trouble solving the problem is we're defining it incorrectly. I mean, it's like rum and coke makes you drunk. Whiskey and coke make you drunk. The common element is coke. We've got to figure out why coke makes people drunk. We laugh at that. I've seen an awful lot of people that are sick and tired of reading about the link between cancer and smoking. We're just going to have to give up reading. So here we all sit saying we've got to fix the transportation problem and it's cars, it's oil, it's pollution. I'll take the position for you that cars in a hundred years, it's the largest industry on the planet, supplies a lot of great uh, jobs. And I'd argue that, by the way, last year, 14 million people in the United States tripped or fell down and hurt themselves badly enough from a standing position that they needed to go to the hospital for care. A modern car can drive into a tree at 30 miles an hour, and it's rare that somebody gets hurt. These are magnificent pieces of technology that scream along highways at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, carrying you and your whole family from one city to another, making commerce possible, making us have a high standard of living, bringing goods all over the place. What's wrong with these machines? They keep you warm all winter and cool all summer. They can take you anywhere you want to go. They carry all our goods. And at constant speed, when they're not accelerating and decelerating, they're remarkably efficient. You get their catalytic converters hot, they're remarkably clean. They were designed to run at these nice speeds, and they do it extremely well. They cost less per pound than a hamburger. They typically run reliably these days for five or ten years. If I picked up this computer and tapped it as I put it down over there, we'd all be relieved if it still worked. Your car is this indestructible pile of technology. I could argue, yeah, it's true, they've had a hundred years, they've had a lot of R&D, but the reason people are frustrated that there isn't a lot of improvement in cars isn't because they're so crummy, it's because they're starting to reach some of the limits of their capability. What we're complaining about is fundamentally an entire misuse of that technology. I mean, I flew out here in a plane, and I'm not embarrassed to say, I fly a plane. It takes a lot of fuel too, but I get that thing up to 41,000 feet. I'm cruising along at eight-tenths the speed of sound. I'm proud of what humans have done with technology. And I don't think anybody in this room would think, it's time to go to Boeing. I know that they can build a device that can take me and my whole neighborhood from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States in five hours, and yeah, it's okay, and they're incredibly safe, that's okay. But it's time to go complain to them because once it lands, that last five miles, when I taxi home, those wings start cutting down trees, and, and my neighbors complain about those jet engines. We all have figured out, you optimize the airplane, you really want to go 600 miles an hour, you can do it. You leave the thing at the airport. You build an infrastructure that makes it do what it's supposed to do, and you don't do something else with it. And if you do do something else with it, you can't go back and complain that Boeing failed because the thing isn't as quiet as a bicycle. Yet, we all have managed to decide that cars belong everywhere. Yes, I did just say I love them, but I don't keep one in my living room, and I don't think they belong in the middle of cities. So let's jump from 1903 to 2003. What happened to the world? We went from a billion people on the planet to six billion. That's bad enough. Here's the real catch. In the entire course of human history, for the first time in human history, more than 50% of the people that are now alive live in cities or megacities. So Henry Ford's great solution